today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the Biblia cum glossa ordinaria. Now, if I botch that, it's because I didn't learn Latin in school, like most people who were educated in the mid-20th century in America. My mother had Latin in a high school, but by the time I came along, it was no longer being offered. This is a hardback in a dust jacket with a sewn binding. It is a large volume. We'll talk about that in a minute. First, I'm going to let you know what this is. If you read that, you'll see it's the Great Medieval Commentary on Sacred, Sacred Scripture, and this is the volume on Genesis. This could be considered the first study Bible, and it consists of the Vulgate text with short elucidations, which are called glosses. This volume is Genesis only, the biblical text is based on the 1899 John Murphy edition of Challoner's Dewey Reams, which I have a copy of. The commentary is from a 1480-81 printed edition of this medieval commentary, printed by uh, Adolf Rush. And it includes glosses that largely consist of excerpts from commentaries by Augustine Jerome and other patristic and medieval authors. To give you a sense for dimensions, 11 and 5 sixteenths inches tall, 8 and 3 quarters inches wide, and it is 1.2 inches thick at the spine. It is a larger volume than the ancient Christian commentary on scripture, scripture volume on Genesis. It is taller and thicker and wider. It is also much bigger than this Dewey Reams Bible we just looked at, although not as thick, much taller and much wider. So here is a look at the page layout. You see the biblical text in the center column in red, and this looks like a black letter text to me. The um, glosses appear in the marginal columns on either side. Sometimes there are three columns here, as you see here. Sometimes there are only two columns, one column of biblical text and then a gloss to the side. And sometimes there's only one column where there's only the biblical text and there are no relevant glosses to print. There are two types of glosses. We just spoke about the marginal glosses a moment ago, and they're somewhat lengthy compared to these interlinear glosses. This gloss goes to this section of text immediately below it, and you'll see these little marks, and we will talk about their function momentarily. Pages are 280 millimeters by 213. That's 11 inches tall. 8.4 inches wide. There are margins. I don't know why anyone would want to write in a beautiful volume like this, but if you did, margin from the top line of the text to the edge of the paper is about 24 millimeters. That's just under an inch. The inner margin can be as much as 20 millimeters. The outer margin is around 17. And the bottom, from the bottom of a descender, such as that, and through to the edge of the paper is about 22 millimeters. The uh, title is at the inside top, so you see commentary on Genesis there. Page contents are at the outside top of the page, and they give you the first full verse that appears on the page. So the first full verse in the center text here is 323 in Genesis. Page numbers are at the bottom of the page, and chapters are divided by the word chapter and a numeral after it. The font here in the biblical text, you see it's printed in red. This looks like a black letter font to me. It's about 14 points in height. The inner linear glosses, so this gloss goes with this line of text, the inner linear glosses are about 7.5 points, so a bit of a strain for older eyes. The marginal glosses are an easily read 10-point font. I looked for print non-uniformity. I didn't find any. It seems to be printed very evenly throughout. 
the paper, as you see, has very little show through at all. It's very opaque. It's a heavy yellowish tinged, very matte paper, so there's no gloss, no shine. After the end of the text and commentary in Genesis, you come to an endnote section. It's divided into two subsections, endnotes for the commentary, and then endnotes for the interlinear glosses and the scripture itself. These endnotes are in about a seven and a half point font. They're printed in two columns, and occasionally the text itself will identify, misidentify the contributor of the gloss. So it's always a good idea to check back here. The translator has also provided useful additional information at some of these. You'll see, for instance, here there's 561, gives you additional information. Could be useful background information. So I uh, have found that consulting these endnotes is very helpful. And here are the scripture and interlinear glosses. So you see things like Dewey Reams, Lord God. Come next to the bibliography, it's seven pages long. It's about an eight and a half point font in a single column. It's divided into several subsections. Primary sources, beginning with Alquin, and then editions of the Bible, modern Latin editions, and English translations of the gloss. Secondary sources. Secondary sources continues for a few pages. Then we're at the back of the volume. We have a couple of pages of paper. We have a paper liner. So I showed you this at the beginning of the video. And the back. So you can freeze that and read that, I think, if you like. Make sure the glare is not on it, at least. For a portion of the time. There are as normal, as they normally are on a dust jacket on the inside and the back side there's additional commentary. So these look like recommendations. And then on the back we have a bit of biographical information on the translator and thanks very much to the translator for providing me this copy for review. With the dust jacket off, you see this is the cover. It's red with gold lettering. There's the spine. It's a strongly made, sturdy volume with a sewn binding. Um, I should mention, since I always do this, I should mention that you have both um, head and tail bands. They're yellow. You can clearly see the signatures there indicate that it's a sewn binding. We'll show you the stitching as well in a moment. Um, it's not a gilt-edged Bible, of course. This is a normal hardback book. The stitching is uh, visible at the introduction, so we'll show that as we page through. So as we come in from the beginning, the first thing, thing we're met with is praise for this edition from various sources. Uh, Andrew Saltzman of Benedict College, Rachel Brown, University of Chicago, Ephraim Radner, University of Toronto, etc. Then we have title pages, half title, the full title. This is an Emmaus Academic Edition published in Steubenville, Ohio. There's a Franciscan University there. Copyright page. Commentary is translated from the Glossa Ordinaria printed by Adolf Rush in Strasbourg, 1480-81. The author's uh, translator's introduction will provide much more information on that. Biblical text is based on the 1899 John Murphy Company Douay Reims. Um, but there are some minor variations, as the translator mentions in his introduction. Here we have the ISBNs for the different editions. Library of Congress catalog 
cataloging and publication data applied for, so we don't have the Library of Congress number yet, cover design, layout, etc. Dedication, contents. So the material up front is what we'll see momentarily, and then the various chapters and notes we've seen, bibliography we have seen. I want to show you two paragraphs from the preface. The first one, particularly as it mentions the utility of patristic exegesis in the care of souls and the medieval schoolmen's um, desire and genius for compiling and arranging, and it gives a list of compilations there. And then the following paragraph which uh, mentions the Ancient Christian Commentary series. That was the hardback volume I showed you at the beginning of the video, at least the edition, the copy from Genesis was there. Um, modern endeavors suffer the same unavoidab unavoidable fault. They address the questions that modern man considers salient. In the gloss, we're confronted with answers to questions we never think to ask. Did God not declare the second day of cre creation good because the number two is somehow evil? How is it that Isaac, a holy and chaste patriarch, could lower himself to play carnally with his wife? Was Melchizedek actually Sem, the son of Noah? The next page is abbreviations, and these I think are very useful to you, particularly as you use those endnotes. So if you see an endnote that says, Augustine de Gal. This will tell you which work of Augustine's that refers to. Just looking myself at one on Bede, and I saw it was Bede IG, and this tells you the name of the work. The next page is from Russia's 1480-81 printed edition, and even not knowing Latin, I can see that this corresponds to this page in English. I mentioned a moment ago that you could see the stitching at the introduction, and so here we are. You can see them in the margin here. The introduction contains a great deal of very useful and interesting information. I'm just going to give highlights. Please freeze the video and read the paragraphs as we go along. This compilation and distinctive page layout were completed and designed in the 12th century. Throughout the gloss on Genesis, one finds many individual glosses that place authorities in conflict with one another. It is uncertain who compiled the gloss on Genesis. Where do the glosses come from? Well, a large number of them are by Augustine of Hippo. The next most prevalent source is Jerome. Jerome likes to be critical of the Septuagint and his glosses are often paired with glosses from Augustine defending the Septuagint. Glosses also come from Gregory the Great, Isidore of Seville, Bede, Alcuin. Extracts from writers of the second millennium are rare. This paragraph talks about the expense of books and the utility of the gloss and giving access to Augustine and Jerome and other contributors in an affordable way. Then the last two paragraphs, I think, are very important, and I encourage you to read them. Um, he talks about the three-column format, which we've seen already. The height of the middle column varies. Individual marginal glosses are usually introduced by Lamata, a few words from the biblical passage which the gloss addresses. They're printed in bold and small caps, and you may have noticed that in passing as we glanced earlier at selections. The, do, the Lamata do not always reproduce exactly the biblical text, and that's because sometimes the commentator, such as Augustine, was reading an old Latin translation, not Jerome's Vulgate. Marginal glosses are often attributed to a particular author, but the attributions are sometimes erroneous. This is one of the reasons I mentioned that it's very useful to look at those endnotes. And uh, the final paragraph, he mentions that he reproduces the translation as found in the 
1899, John Murphy Dewey Reams. Occasionally there are minor differences, so he's corrected the Dewey Reams uh, to agree with the Latin in um, the gloss. The first edition did not separate the chapters into verses, but he's added his own um, verse numbers. The interlinear glosses are linked to the biblical text by a system of tie marks and section marks. Based on those in Rush, the, each interlinear gloss begins with both a tie mark and a section mark. Additional section marks printed introduce further glosses on the same word a biblical text. So let's, let's look at an example to see what he's talking about. So here on page 20, looking at Genesis 1-2, and the earth was void and empty. You see in the text here in red, a cross, a double cross, and then an up arrow. Those are our tie marks. The first tie mark ties this of our flesh to earth. So earth is being interpreted as flesh. Then corporeal substance apparently is another interpretation that ties to earth. So those, those are the two section marks. And the next time mark connects to void before it had accepted the form of doctrine. And the next is formless and imperfect, so two sections connecting to void. And then the third time mark is to empty with only one section of those things which were to be formed from it. Now, if you found that somewhat inscrutable, you're apparently not alone, because if we go back to page 5 in, th in the introduction, the translator explains to us that the short interlinear glosses function as memory aids. To a first-time reader, these interlinear glosses often seem incomprehensible, but for the learned master, they were sufficient to remind him of the traditional exegesis of that passage. In this section of the video, I'll give you a chance to take a look at some of the marginal annotations. This one at the lemma, and there was evening, says it's from Augustine, and it says, uh, one day was completed, 24 hours. And uh, you can freeze that and read it entirely, but I'm going to go to the end notes and look at end note number 80. So if we look at number 80, we see it's actually from Bede, from that source IG. If you don't remember what IG is, you need to look up towards the front of the volume at the abbreviations. And he says this gloss is from Bede, not Augustine. I've moved now to page 60, and here is a marginal gloss about the Devil's Fall and how that was due to pride. On page 66, we have a note from Jerome on she shall keep thy head and thou shalt keep her heel, telling you that he prefers the Hebrew. And then there's following that a note from Augustine. I will pan down so that you can read it. I'll pan one more time. On page 68, there's a footnote about the name Eve. Um, I should pan up just a bit so you can see the preceding note. Then let's go down the page. If we go to the top column on the following page, it picks up with the discussion of what garments of skins means. And I may have missed it, but I don't see anything here that relates this to the necessity of a sacrifice, which is what I was expecting to read. We have a note on, and the Lord God made, from Augustine. And then the plural associated with the Trinity. So again, please freeze and read. On page 69, we find another note from Jerome correcting the Septuagint. On page 80, we see an explanation of who the sons of God and the daughters of men are. And so now we're in an era where the children of Seth and the stock of Cain are the preferred explanations.
And a note on my spirit shall not always remain. And perhaps we can show the rest of this column. Here is a gloss on the left-hand column that you might find startling, which uh, connects Christ with Noah in interesting ways. I'll pan down so that you can read, read to the end. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Here's the comment, a mystical interpretation in the left-hand column. And if we go farther down the page, it says, look up to heaven. So again, my purpose here is to give you a flavor for the kinds of interpretations one finds in the glosses. Here's one from page 116 on Genesis 17. And um, this is on the children who uh, were not circumcised. This is a gloss from Gregory, Gregory the Great, on what it means to flee Sodom. Connected to Genesis 28 is this gloss by Isidore. This um, explains Jacob's ladder. So I will move the camera to the top of the left column of the next page. So you can read that. Here on page 211, you have only one column of um, commentary in the margins. And I wanted to show you in particular this gloss from Isidore on They Forthwith Stripped Him. So I thought that was somewhat interesting. The following page, page 212, is back to three columns, but you see how sparsely annotated it is. And I want to show you the gloss on the left, which connects uh, Judah and Judas and their betrayals. And finally, let's just quickly look at some of the interlinear glosses on chapter 41, when Pharaoh had a dream. Um, he thought he stood by the river. If we look at the interlinear glosses on river, the river signifies the rushing of unstable people, and on it stands the person who tramples the love of temporal things. Then on, of which came up seven kine, we have a gloss on kine. The kind of spiritual grace is coming forth to nourish the infancy of the primitive church. We come down here to marshy places, marshy or humble places, hence upon whom shall my spirit rest, but upon the one humble and quiet, and that trembleth at my words. Other seven, so who are the other seven? The other seven are spiritual iniquities. They also came up out of the river, ill-favored, and lean-fleshed. Lean flesh does not fit for nourishment. And they fed on the very bank of the river in green places. So they're feeding on tender minds. Just a brief note on whether it lies open easily. I have broken it in, and you can kind of require it to lie open, but it does have a tendency to want to fold back in on itself. 
I think by pressing it down, once you've broken it in, you'll be able to read it. A, a relatively flat surface without great difficulty. So in summary, I think this is an excellent volume. It's a very useful resource and it would be worthwhile to you to have this in, in your library. If you're at all interested in this kind of um, allegorical, anagogical, tropological, and uh, sometimes literal interpretation philosophy that you find in the authors collected here in this volume, uh, it's well made, it's a sturdy volume, the paper is heavy, you do, do not have show-through issues. Uh, it is somewhat expensive, but um, I think it's definitely worthwhile. So with that, we will conclude the video. Thanks very much for watching, and thanks again to the translator for providing this copy for review.